the story was known in the medieval times, but the only thing I could find that was written, uh, I could only find little pieces of it, and it was in, you know, the Chaucer English that I would have needed to practice, and I couldn't find the whole thing anyway, so I've got a translation of um, Orpheus and Eurydice. So, the story begins just as Hymen, the god of marriage and weddings, has departed after attending the nuptials of Orpheus and Eurydice. Veiled in a saffron mantle, through the air unmeasured, after the strange wedding, Hymen departed swiftly for Siconian land, regardless and not listening to the voice of tuneful Orpheus. Surely Hymen there was, a, there was present during the festivities of Orpheus and Eurydice, but gave no happy omen, neither hollowed words nor, nor joyful glances, and the torch he held would only sputter, fill the eyes with smoke, and cause no blaze while waving. The result of that sad wedding, proved more terrible than such foreboding fates. While through the grass, delighted naiads wandered with the bride, a serpent stuck its venom tooth in her soft ankle, and she died. After the bard of Rhodope had mourned and filled the highs of heaven with moans of his lament, determined also the dark underworld should recognize the misery of his death, misery of the death, he dared descend by the Tenarian gate down to the gloomy sticks. And there passed through pale, glimmering phantoms, and the ghosts escaped from sepulchres, until he found Persephone and Pluto, master king of the shadow realms below. And then began to strike his tuneful lyre, to which he sang, O deity of this dark world beneath the earth, this shadowy underworld to which all mortals must descend, if it can be called lawful, and if you will suffer speech of strict truth all the winding ways of falsity <coughs> forbidden, I come not down here because of curiosity to see the glooms of Tartarus, and have no thought to bind or strangle the three necks of the Medusan monster vile with snakes. But I have come because my darling wife stepped on a viper that sent through her veins death poison, cutting off her coming years. If able, I would bear it. I do not deny my effort. But the god of love has conquered me, a god so kindly known in the upper world. We are not sure he can be known so well in this deep world, but have good reason to conjecture that he is not unknown here. And if old report almost forgotten that you stole your wife is not a fiction, love united you the same as others. By this place of fear, this huge void, and these vast and silent realms, renew the life thread of Eurydice. All things are due to you, and through on the earth it happens we may tarry a short while. Slowly or swiftly, we must go to one abode, and it will be our final home. Long and tenaciously, you will possess unquestioned mastery of the human race. She, shall, she, shall all, she also shall be yours to rule. When full of age, she shall have lived the days of her allotted years. So I ask of you, possession of her few days is a boon. But if the fates deny to me this prayer for my true wife, my constant mind must hold me always that I cannot return, and you may triumph in the death of two. While he sang all his heart, said to the sound of his sweet lyre, the bloodless ghosts themselves were weeping, and the anxious Tantalus stopped clutching at the return flow of wave of the wave. Aeson's twisting wheel stood wonderbound, and Titus's liver for a while escaped the vultures, and the listening Belides forgot their sieve-like bulls, and even you, O oh, Sisyphus, sat idly on your rock. Then fame declared that conquered by the song of Orpheus, for the first and only time the hard cheeks and the fierce humanities were wet with tears. Nor could the royal queen, nor he who rules the lower world, deny the prayer of Orpheus. So they called to them Eurydice, who was still held among the new arriving shades, and she obeyed the call by walking to them with slow steps, yet halting from her wound. So Orpheus then received his wife, and Pluto told him, he might now ascend from these Avernian veils up to the light with his, with his Eurydice. But if he turned his eyes to look at her, the gift of her delivery would be lost. They picked their way in silence up a sleep and gloomy path of darkness. There remained but little more to climb till they would touch Earth's surface, when in fear he might again lose her, and anxious for another look at her, he turned his eyes so he could gaze upon her. Instantly, she slipped away. He stretched out to, to her his despairing arms, eager to rescue her, or to feel her form, but could only hold nothing save the yielding air. 
dying the second time, she could not say a word of censure for her husband's fault. What had she to complain of? His great love? Her last word spoken was, farewell, which she could barely hear, and with no further sound she fell from him again to Hades, struck quite senseless by this double death of his dear wife. He was as fixed from motion as the frightened one who saw the triple necks of Cerberus, the dog whose middle neck was chained.